I, for those of you who don't know, I've recently, in the last three months, four months now, whatever, started at Merlin, which is the network that connects all of Manitoba's educational institutions together, all the school divisions, um, most of the post-secondary institutions, not all. Um, and a thanks go out to Merlin for A, giving me the time to do this, and B, not minding if I tell you all about it. <laughs> Which, actually, that can be a big deal sometimes. So what, one of the things I did uh, when I got there was I realized, wait a minute, I'm not running a looking glass server. Now, quick show of hands, who knows what a looking glass server even is? Okay, so internet routing, first off. Everybody uses a protocol called BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol, um, to basically talk to each other. Without getting into any details about BGP, it can sometimes be tricky to troubleshoot because your path to another network might go this way, but the return path might go this way. And that's perfectly legit. That's a reasonably normal state of affairs in the internet at large. A looking glass server, and, and I'm not the only one that runs one, most major networks have one, is a, it's a web server that runs in my network where other people can come to my looking glass server and find out what's my view of the routing world from my perspective. Usually you'd, be usually you'd be looking up your own IP address as seen by me. So if you're trying to figure out, you know, how come I can send packets to them and the packets get there in one and a half milliseconds, but the replies always seem to take 30 or 40 milliseconds, what's going on? I can, you know, the remote person can look at their routing tables and say, okay, well, this packet goes out this interface to that ISP and then it goes around, okay, that, that looks fine. But they've got no visibility into how I'm routing the reverse packet. So the looking glass server is there so you can see, oh, that's how they're routing the reverse, like the reply packet. So I use looking glass servers when I'm debugging paths and I expect that other people will use my looking glass server to debug connectivity issues to me. I've used OpenBSD and OpenBGPD because A, I'm familiar with these products, uh, with these tools. They're very lightweight. They don't take a lot of resources and they're remarkably quick to set up, assuming you aren't running into significant infrastructure issues. Um, if, you know, if everything else is working fine in your environment, an OpenBSD install should take uh, maybe five minutes, tops. That's if you're actually slow and you aren't hitting enter right like at the second that it's ready. If you know what you're doing. If you really know what you're doing, I've done an OpenBGPD, uh, sorry, an OpenBSD install in, I think the fastest one I've ever done took about 45 seconds. <laughs> Now, that was a special case, but like basically everything was cached in RAM. But normally, yeah, it should only take like three, four minutes. Sometimes it takes a little longer, whatever, but still short. It's kind of like doing a CentOS minimal install, except the flow of the questions you have to answer during the install is much more streamlined than clicking around in the CentOS installer GUI. So an OpenBGPD is part of OpenBSD. In order to do, this is basically introspection into the BGP protocol, I have to run BGP or have some way of accessing the BGP database on my router. Well, I don't want to open a connection to my router, interrogate its routing table, parse the output, and then send that back to the client. That's a fairly resource intensive task. What I do instead is I just run BGP on looking glass and I tell it share the route table with my router. Done. And now it's all local in memory cached so lookups again are become super efficient, very low cost. Um, I think I've got like two CPU cores allocated to this thing and if memory serves one gig of memory. So and the disk I think it's only like eight gigs of disk space and it's only using about two. So compared to our Linux standard template, this thing's microscopic. So 
I will show uh, how I did the VM in VMware's vSphere product. We've got the screenshots and the explanation because you, not everybody here has seen vSphere. This is what vSphere 6.5, I think, yes. looks like. Um, I'm using the HTML5 interface, I think. There's also a Flash-based interface. No, thank you. Um, it's painful. And again, minimal resources required. So, can anybody beside the front row even read that? So, new virtual machine. This is what the UI looks like. I pick new virtual machine. I can't even read it on my screen. <laughs> um, <clears throat> sorry, can I zoom? I can zoom on my screen. I have to select. Oh, zoom there too. Select a name and folder. And, you know, here's the folders in my vSphere install. I picked one Merlin internal. It's kind of what this is going to look like. Uh, how do I go to the next slide? There we go. And vSphere has the notion of compute resources, so I can carve up. So I think I've got 12 very, very large hosts in this vSphere cluster. And when I say very, very large, we're talking there, each of the 12 machines has about half a terabyte of memory. So they're, they're big. I also don't want any of my VMs running amok and chewing up all my resources because it could take a while and I could take offline a whole bunch of clients if I let them do it. So everything is carved up into containers and VMware automatically um, give, does like so-called fair allocation across all the containers. So no one customer, unless I specifically let them, can monopolize my resources. Actually, Eric should be able to tell us that we don't let our servers get overcommitted, and this is one of the ways how. Mm -hmm. um, new virtual machine, and then zooming in, select storage again. Got all these SAN arrays. They're, I think they're most of these are NFS. Some of them are iSCSI. Doesn't really matter. I just pick where I want to go. I'm putting it on an SSD backed array because I can. <laughs> really, no other reason. I don't need that much performance. New virtual machine. What is this saying? Compatible with um, VMware vSphere is just one of the products in a whole family of products. You've got VMware Fusion for Mac OS. You've got VMware Workstation for Windows and Linux. You've got VMware Player for Win Windows and Linux. Um, you've got VMware ESXi, which is sort of a standalone server. And you can export the machines from one product and import them into another product pretty much natively. Um, so that's what this screen is saying is, what's the minimum level that I want to be able to import this thing at. I don't actually plan to export it, so I just pick whatever the native version is. Select a guest OS. Now, OpenBSD is not available as a selection, so I pick the closest thing that seems reasonable, which is 64-bit FreeBSD. And it works well enough. Perfect? No, it's not perfect, but FreeBSD is close enough to OpenBSD that this works. Question? No? All the way back. <laughs> Question? Um, have you personally experienced any drawbacks from choosing other 64-bit for using yep. OpenBSD? Timer resolution. Uh, the ACPI timer and the I-8245, I think, emulation, which is the Intel programmable interrupt controller, those are the two common methods of timekeeping, or, or rather kernel tick keeping uh, on x86 class hardware. The VMware does something funny with the emulation of those timer resources. And that's one of the things that changes under the hood, depending on what OS you select. If you pick Windows, Windows doesn't really care very much if you lose a few ticks here and there. Um, in fact, it really doesn't care at all. 
So VMware knows that it can be a little bit more lax about scheduling that tick on a Windows VM than on, say, an OS2 VM. It's, the changes are really subtle behind this, but they can have an impact. And even choosing FreeBSD 64-bit, my timer emulation is not perfect. Um, so choosing be any better under FreeBSD? <laughs> uh, slightly. Okay. OpenBSD happens to be sensitive to that, which is unfortunate. If I pick other 64-bit, I believe OpenBSD runs a little bit better, but like you know, a 10% improvement in runtime timer resolution equates to a like 200% increase in CPU utilization on the host. So I'm like, no, it doesn't have to be that good. I'm willing to live with the occasional pause at the terminal when I'm doing stuff. It's, uh, so yeah, it does make a difference, but not huge differences. Uh, the other thing that makes a difference, the other thing this affects, the big one is what flavor of virtual Ethernet hardware you get by default and what flavor of virtual SCSI you get by default. You can always override it, um, but if you pick an OS that VMware knows, well, there's never been a driver for this type of network card for that OS ever. It's not going to offer it to you if you've picked that OS. So, you know, FreeBSD gets me the VMware Power Virtual SCSI driver, which is really fast and efficient and speedy and low latency. If I picked, say, DOS, I get some antique SCSI controller that's being emulated because the DOS emulation for that exists and works properly. So there's differences, not huge. Um, now I did have to make some changes in this screen. This is the summary screen. So two CPUs. Oh, I gave it eight gigs of RAM. Yeah, just in case. 20 gig hard drive. It's on a network. Client device? No, I think it's something with that. And here I have to change some things. I changed the HDD from SCSI to IDE because there's a bug in the OpenBSD installer. Mm -hmm. This is unfortunate. Um, after I move the hard drive off the SCSI controller, I nuke the SCSI controller. There's a bug in OpenBSD's VMXNet 3 driver, so I go back to the VMXNet 2, which works perfectly fine and uses like 5% more CPU or something. I pick the correct VLAN because the default one is never correct. That's normal, that's VMware. I have to attach a CD-ROM drive, which is the ISO image that I'm going to install OpenBSD from. I have to attach the OpenBSD Net Install 64 image, set the video card to auto-detect, and because I'm kind of anal about these things, I told it, no, boot into the so-called BIOS setup screen, the virtual BIOS setup screen, so that I can turn off the things that don't even exist in my VM because I don't know why I care. It makes like maybe two or three milliseconds worth of difference at boot time, but <laughs> I'm in the habit of fixing it, so I just always do that. Um, after, I, after all that, ready to complete, click finish to start creation, and it gives me another summary. This one is not editable. I click finish, that says finish down there. And we're off to the races. Next thing I do is I power on the VM. The BIOS screen will show on automatically because I turned that option on. And the one thing I always change in the BIOS is the boot order because it's really annoying when you reboot a virtual server, forget that you have left an ISO image attached to it um, and you're expecting that the server will just reboot after you type in reboot, enter. You're like, okay, give it two minutes and try and SSH back in. And Oh, shit, my server's not up anymore. Uh-oh, what happened? And, you know, if this wasn't, say, in an outage window and you needed it to be back up within two minutes and you forgot that that CD-ROM image was still connected and it boots to the CD-ROM by default and it goes back into the installer... Um, it usually takes you a few minutes to figure out what you did wrong, power it off, disconnect the CD, then restart, restart the VM, and now you're what you thought was a 
60 second, maybe two minute outage has now turned into a 10 minute outage and people are starting to yell at you. <clears throat> so I always change the boot order in the BIOS screen. This is the OpenBSD boot screen. That is the VMware remote console window that you're looking at. And BSD has, OpenBSD has its own bootloader. This is basically BSD's version of Grub, or OpenBSD's version of Grub, more or less. And just like Grub, if you want it to do the defaults, you just step away from the keyboard and things happen. If you want to make the defaults happen faster, you just hit enter and you're done. Or if you need to do any other settings, this is where you can, you know, boot dash S for single user mode. You can disable devices in PCI space so that OpenBSD never even sees that they're there. The bootloader is fairly powerful, much like Grub is pretty powerful now. And so they've got similar capabilities. It's telling me that it found a hard disk. The plus means something to do with partitioning, I forget what. The star means, hey, I found an active partition and this is gonna be my boot device. And CD0 just says, and I found a CD, we can try booting off that if you really want to. I believe I just left it alone. Oops, what is that? OpenBSD boot will automatically continue after five seconds if no key is pressed. And you can change it just like in Grub. And then we're into the actual OpenBSD installer. Um, yeah, a second. Let me zoom into this. And there, there is one thing on this screen that is not normal, and that is, um, oops, this. That line where I've typed in dot slash install. That's in this screenshot because I had canceled out of the installer and I was too lazy to reboot the VM before I took the screenshot. So normally you would see at any prompt except password, you can shell out in the middle of the installer, which can sometimes be super convenient. You can hit control Z, that dumps you back to the shell, super convenient. Um, and it wants to know things like, what's my keyboard layout? What's the system host name? Which network interface would I like to configure? And this is literally a sequential thing. You just, if the defaults work for you, you can literally, it's like a Windows install. Enter, 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 enter. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> Except unlike a Windows install, you can do it pretty much that fast in real time. <clears throat> um, and you'll notice here, I am typing in my IP address I'm not having to type in my IPv6 address, so I must have typed it in in the previous run before I canceled out. Um, I actually have to say done when I'm done setting up my network interfaces. It wants my default router, wants my domain name, wants my DNS name servers, my root password. So all the basic things you have to tell OpenBSD. In fact, there's the list. I for install keyboard, host name, network, v4, v6, gateway, domain name, DNS, password, and then just like CentOS or Ubuntu, wants you to create a regular non-root user. And I screwed up and I don't have those lines captured in a screen cap. Um, but that's the very next thing after setting the root password. And you'll see that here, installation steps continued. So you enter the password for that user. You decide whether root can log in via SSH or not. Um, don't say yes. If you, if you have to, say prohibit password. Now, yes, there are scenarios in which logging in as root by SSH using a password is actually acceptable and not a really stupid thing to do. Those situations are becoming a smaller and smaller subset of reality with every passing day. You really shouldn't be doing that at this point in time. You should be logging in as the regular user you set up, SUing to root, and worst case, using SSH keys to log in as root. Um, that wants to know what time zone I'm in. 
What disk am I installing to? Do I use the whole disk? Do I want to use it as an MBR disk, a GPT disk? That's handy because I can boot in MBR mode and create a disk that's ready to go for UEFI mode or vice versa. I can actually pick in the middle of the installer. Um, <clears throat> OpenBSD wants to automatically partition my disk for me. Much like, uh, well, so do CentOS and Ubuntu nowadays. OpenBSD, however, creates a few more partitions than your average Linux distro. And uh, considerably more than your average mainstream BSD distro, aka <coughs> Mac OS, um, which creates one by default. This actually does make sense in some scenarios. If you're running a system that absolutely has to stay up at virtually all costs, the default layout is designed specifically so that any one partition can fill up and it will not take down your entire system. This is very old school. Um, some of, okay, two of the people in the room will remember doing this on real hardware where you had one disk for root, one disk for user, one disk for var, one disk for this. OpenBSD, um, actually if you're not aware, OpenBSD still runs perfectly fine on hardware like Vaxes. Um, actually, they might have finally dropped Vax, but <laughs> like, it still runs on ancient hardware where the biggest disks you can attach are on the order of like 60 megabytes. So sometimes you have to do this still. On, on the some of the OpenBSD build servers, they literally have you know eight physical hard disks in a system, and each partition occupies an entire disk. And then they NFS mount the actual important stuff, like the, the build tree, the source tree. But you need all these to get to the point where you can NFS mount something. So um, do I want to use the auto layout, edit the auto layout, or create a custom layout? And I say, custom, please. And as I say here, the default partition scheme still offers some nice features. There's actually security improvements if you take that default partition scheme because a number of those partitions are mounted no SUID, uh, no exec, uh, no WX allowed, which is the default, which means anything that's writable cannot be executed. Um, and that's the default out of the box. So I'm actually going to relax some of the security restrictions in OpenBSD in the next screen. So make sure you understand why OpenBSD is giving you this before you say, no, that's stupid. It's not stupid, but it doesn't mean it's good for you or me. It's maybe good if you're running a hardened system. Question? One tiny annoying thing is when you allocate a sizable disk mm -hmm. and then you do the auto selection <laughs> and it will make home a humongous. Yep and will not kind of distribute it a little more evenly. Yep. There's, uh, there's built-in caps on all those partition sizes. And once you get, like I said, past a certain point, and you've hit the max on all the partitions except home, home is the only one that keeps growing, which is annoying. I agree. It's also good, but depends on your use case, right? Okay. So the sub-partitioning of subdirectories of slash user, is that for different mount options for security, or is it a space consideration thing, or what? Um, <laughs> well, user OBJ is separate from user source uh, for a couple of reasons. One is user source can fairly readily be shared across multiple machines, so that can be an NFS mount if you want, instead of a separate partition. Uh, even if it's a separate partition, that is one thing that you might find, well, both of those, source and OBJ, are partitions that it might be easier, a lot easier and quicker, to simply unmount, new FS, and remount, versus deleting or overwriting the existing source trees. Uh, user OBJ in particular, if the build world script 
detects that your user OBJ is, well, this used to be a thing. I, they may have taken it out now. Used to be if user OBJ was mounted separately, because that's where all the compiled objects from user source go. So all your .o files and all your .a files and all your .so files and your finished binaries all land in a tree under user OBJ that mirrors user source. Um, at one point in time, I haven't looked at this in years, the, the make, make clean world or make world clean or there's something along those lines would actually detect whether you detect whether user OBJ was a separate partition, detect if you were running as root, and if you were, would attempt to unmount it, new FS it, remount it, and then recreate the empty tree. Because on older systems, like nowadays on an SSD, it doesn't make any difference. OpenBSD's file system is notoriously slow compared to other modern file systems. But if you're running on SSDs or in a VM environment, it's still fast enough that there's no way you'd ever, like, it doesn't make any difference. Well, lots of RAM goes on these too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, go back even six or seven years, and a lot of these boxes were running on 5,400 RPM hard drives on slow processors with limited RAM. And RM-RF on a big, wide, deep tree is actually really slow. So you could save, like, when I started, well, okay, 20 years ago, when I was using OpenBSD 3, by new FSing user OBJ, that would save me about an hour and a half every time I wanted to redo a build world. So, yeah, I liked having user OBJ on its own partition back then. Does OpenBSD support any volume manager to reset No. Nope. There's no volume manager for OpenBSD. Yeah. The official recommendation is basically if you really need a volume manager for OpenBSD, go buy an NFS server. I've got another hack that could work in your environment. Yep. Because you're allocating virtual disks, you could allocate a virtual disk per uh, yep. uh, file system. Yep, I totally could. I, so that, that's how you would future-proof yourself from OpenBSD mm -hmm. on a virtualized environment. Yeah. Um, the best you can do with OpenBSD is you can resize, you can, sorry, not just resize, you can grow a file system. You can't shrink it, um, and you can only grow it if you've got room to grow the partition that it's on. So, yeah, disk management capabilities in OpenBSD are very limited. This is not the OS you want to run as a file server. Um, I mean, you can, there are people who do it. It's very lightweight, but it's not fast and it's not super featureful for that particular role. What about ZFS? ZFS is license compatible with, uh, no, sorry, it is not. The OpenBSD project leader, Theo Durat, who is, um, He's an known for having very strong opinions on things. This is Adam saying this. You know what's true. Yes, yes it is. Um, yeah, even I think Theo's a little bit extreme. Um, he basically has decreed that the CDDL license is not compatible enough with the BSD license. <clears throat> and OpenBSD will never import CDDL licensed source code. And I'm like, okay, you've got GPL source code in your fucking tree. How can CDDL be worse than GPL? <clears throat> but he is the. I guess the answer to that question is Oracle. Uh, <laughs> yes, that, that is ultimately the answer. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind wants to trust Oracle. <laughs> because Oracle will go out of their way to be malicious. Um, they're the most likely candidate for a next-gen file system in OpenBSD is actually the Hammer 2 file system from Dragonfly BSD, which provides many of the same capabilities as ZFS. It's not intended as a ZFS competitor. Um, it doesn't do everything ZFS does, but at least it would be a lot better than UFS2. However, all the people 
who are intimately familiar with the virtual memory and file system management bits in OpenBSD, have said, let me get back to you on that. <laughs> in other words, it ain't going to be easy. So with OpenBSD, you're basically using the native UFS, UFFS file system or or NFS. Yep, or NFS. I mean, it, it does support a couple of others, but they're no better. Like, great, it supports FAT32, whoopity doo da. And it supports the old UFS file system. That's No, that's even worse. Um, supports ISO 9660. Well, <clears throat> that's not helpful. Uh, isn't there native read write EXT2? Is it read write? That was read only. You might only want to use that in read only mode if you're read only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there is some support for EXT2, but yeah, file system support is not OpenBS3's strong point. Installation steps. So I added a slice, I filled the whole disk, I mounted it at root. I declined to create, so I created partition A, which is the default root partition. I declined to create a partition B, which is the default swap partition, because for what this box is doing, I don't need swap. I don't want swap. If it runs out of memory, fine, crash. That's perfectly acceptable in this scenario. Uh, in fact, I'd actually rather it crash than start swapping, because it's a non-critical, non-production service. At least then I'll know something bad happened. Well, that's the thing. Like it's a running a looking glass and a BGP routing table. If it takes more than eight gigs of RAM, yeah. something's seriously wrong with my server. So I typed A to add, and I just hit enter, 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 and then I said mount point is root. Done. I'm going through the whole OpenBSD install in detail because we haven't done it for about three years, I think. Longer. Maybe four. And yeah, it's changed a little bit. A lot of you won't have seen it. So then I quit the partition editor. I wait for formatting to finish. Even NuFS on OpenBSD, which is equivalent to MKFS, is unfortunately slow. It's not bad. Select HTTP, skip the proxy, give the server name mug.ca. Accept the default path because, hey, we know what we're doing. And over here, so if we know what we're doing, if we know what we're doing, it's only because we stumbled on it by accident. <laughs> no, actually, the pub open BSD I made sure was the right path and the right capitalization and the right everything, so we just work out of the box. Um, so again, this is the middle of the installer. To get to this point, it has taken me easily 10 times as long to talk about it as it took me to do it. And I just say, yeah, install everything, because everything on an OpenBSD install is smaller than the nothing on a CentOS install. <laughs> <clears throat> and that literally does get me everything. Wait for installation to complete. Um, now, I'm doing a network-based install, so I'm pulling all these files across the network from the mug server. And the biggest one, which was the compiler suite, took 13 seconds to install. Mm -hmm. Fetch across the network, untar, write to disk, sync, done. Oh, 13 wait, seconds. How can you do that? Uh, suppose you want to use you know, your iPhone and you want to install OpenBSD. Is there, I couldn't get it done. On the iPhone? Yeah, using tethering from an iPhone. Oh. Uh, hooking it up to uh, USB and then... Because I don't think there's any Wi-Fi support in the installer. No, no, not Wi-Fi, just using USB. There definitely isn't support for that. No Wi-Fi support. Well, um, the iPhone... Uh, iPhone does not use the RNDIS uh, model for Ethernet over USB, no. which is what most tethering devices, like every Android device does. Mm -hmm. uh, Apple, of course, has their own proprietary way of doing Ethernet over USB. OpenBSD does not support it. So I need an app for that? You know, actually, you would need a, uh, a reverse AP. Um, a wireless client. A wireless, yeah, wireless bridge, basically. Um, they're often, they're little tiny Wi-Fi devices. They can usually either operate as an access point or as a wireless client. 
either way. Yeah. They're often sold for like people who spend a lot of time in hotels. And they've got devices that only have Ethernet while well, you plug it into this little box. The box talks to Wi-Fi, and now you've got standard Ethernet to the internet. Um, so there are some... In the cellular world, there's boxes like that too. Yep. You put a SIM in it and it's got Ethernet on the other side. So where, where can you buy this? Can you buy this locally here or on the um, internet? Best Buy, bridges? Best Buy used to carry them? Memory Express might have one. But that's a round table. Yeah, Memory Express might. Memory Express be, has ubiquity gear. However, to, honestly, it'd be far simpler to just do the install somewhere where you've got an Ethernet jack. And then well, take the image to... Uh, well, once you've installed it, <laughs> you can connect to your iPhone over Wi-Fi. But you have to install OpenBSD, and it has to boot the first time, download the firmware images it needs to for your Wi-Fi card, and then you're good to go. Yeah, the thing is I wanted to use to install off the internet. You know what I mean? To pull yeah. the packages. Yep. Um, do you have a Windows machine? Uh, or a well, Mac? Yes, I've got Windows, I've got a Macintosh. Just as, long as, you've got, Mac as long as you've got a Windows machine or a Mac okay. or Linux um, that has Wi-Fi that can connect to your iPhone, um, you would just uh, do the share my internet connection thing, either on Windows or Mac OS, and then connect the two Ethernet ports together from your Windows box, your Mac OS box, to the machine you're going to install OpenBSD on. Because then your Windows machine or your Mac OS machine basically acts like a router. And that's 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 a thing. What I was going to add here is the network path from Merlin to Mug Server at West End is a very very few hops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the right? path from where to where from Merlin to Merlin to, to West on it with uh, oh, yeah. Mug Server. Yeah. That would entirely stay within Winnipeg thanks to Mbix. Yes, <laughs> yes, it does. Um, MRNet and Mbix co right. combined. Uh, so yeah, I've got the slowest link between this VM and the mug server is 10 gigabits per second. <laughs> <laughs> I am not ashamed well, of that. So what are you were speed running it? Uh, just about, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I can literally do a network install faster than I can read the ISO off the crappy ass spinning rust based SAN where we store our ISO images. It's actually kind of ridiculous. But the point remains, even if you're running this off like a physical CD-ROM drive, it's only going to take a few, like a couple minutes at most to read in these tar files and extract them to disk. However, I'm done. And do I say reboot? Wait yeah. for installation to complete and reboot. I rebooted here. To configure the OS, log in as root or SSH in as the regular user you created, not root. Use SU to become root. Run syspatch to update the kernel. That's kind of like doing a yum update on Linux or uh, or apt-get dist-upgrade. Uh, dist Same thing, more or less. And then reboot immediately. Because, well, there are critical patches that come out in between every OpenBSD release. And finally, in 2019, like 25 years later, there's a tool to automate the application of critical patches. <laughs> yeah. They could have maybe prioritized that a few, oh, I don't know, decades yeah, ago. Yeah, they were security focused. <laughs> all, all the patch goes into the patches, not the infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. They're so good, they don't need patches. Um, so I'm logged in by SSH. There is another VMware bug. Um, VMware can automatically set the time in the VM, in the guest VM. So you don't need NTP, isn't that wonderful? No, it's actually it's not, because I would like the precision of NTP. And for whatever reason, the, the, the VMware driver in OpenBSD exposes that facility as a sensor which is a special class of device in OpenBSD. Just like you can have a temperature sensor, you can have a fan speed sensor, well, you can also have a time sensor, why not? Uh, and that's how OpenNTPD pulls the VMware time source. However, 
it's consistently off by 30 seconds. <laughs> so there's a bug there somewhere. I don't know where. I'm not sure whose problem, which side the problem's on, but there's a problem. So I have to disable the bloody sensor in every OpenBSD VM and just go use regular NTP servers like NTP meant me to do. Now this, uh, in case you haven't seen it, OpenNTPD, which is the OpenBSD project's re-implementation of NTPD in a much, much, much more secure way, adds a feature called constraints. And they added this like, oh, geez, three years ago? The NTP project finally adopted it about three months ago, uh, maybe a little more. What it does is it takes a known good website, Google, gets the time from that website. Because if you didn't know, the HTTP headers that come back to you from any web server in the world tell you what time that web server thinks it is. There's a timestamp in the HTTP headers on every single request. Google is known for having their web front ends synced pretty well to real or correct time. So it uses that as an initial source of data to say, okay, are my NTP servers giving me complete bullshit information or are they close enough that I'm gonna go, all right, that, that's reasonable, I believe them. So it's just another security check to prevent poisoned NTP servers. Can we ask time.merlin.md.ca what time it is? Let's not go there, please. We can find out for ourselves. Time.merlin.md.ca <laughs> time. Time. is actually a C name for time.mbix.ca. <laughs> Shut up. And time.mbix.ca, and I don't like admitting this because I'm one of the two people who set it up in the first place has some fairly severe timekeeping issues right now. <clears throat> if you're using time.mbix.ca as your NTP source, um, maybe don't right now. Does it get the century right? <laughs> it gets the century right, yes. But uh, the year. it's, no, but it, it's like one, one of the three servers regularly drifts like three seconds away from real time. Mm. And it's a Stratum 1 server. You're kidding me. I wish. The problem is that server believes the time that's coming in from the CDMA time source, which in turn believes the time that MTS's CDMA cell towers are advertising, which has been wrong for about the last six or seven years. Since the last leap second, in fact. <laughs> And because the CDMA network's time source is wrong, it's detecting that, oh my God, something bad is happening with time. It goes into a free running clock mode, occasionally drifts, and then we drift with it. And it's just not good. Maybe it's embarrassing. Sorry? Maybe the Bell acquisition will allow us that to get worse. Um, Actually, once... Bell Mobility finishes swallowing MTS Mobility, yes, that problem will go away. Because the CDMA network will just get turned off. And voila, no more issues. And the GSM slash LTE networks are all synced to GPS anyway. Just name a jammer at that box. CDMA can't get through. Uh, the, no, no. Way, no way you can disable that in software. Uh, well, we could, but somebody actually has to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and since MBEX is a purely volunteer organization, you're also losing one of your Stratum 1 servers then at that point. You might yes. as well take the server offline. Yeah. We're, well, we're losing a Stratum 0 source. Right. Yeah. Which we don't really want to do. Atomic but blocks. We're thinking about it. Well, not we. I'm not on the MBEX board anymore, but yeah. It's been a subject of intense discussion between MBIX, Merlin, MRNet over the last month or so. OS configuration. Unlike systemd, 99.9% .9 of OpenBSD configuration, actually 99.999% of OpenBSD configuration is just in text files, nothing else. And there's one main text file 
etcrc.conf.local. Anytime you see .local, it means that's a file that overrides the file that doesn't have .local. So there's also an etcrc.conf file. It has all the default settings in it, which you can inspect, examine. You can edit if you want, but you're on your own after that point. What you're supposed to do is create rc.conf.local, which overrides rc.conf. And it is essentially shell syntax. All these files, the whole OpenBSD RC system is shell scripts. And this included every single line in this file, that's a valid line to, of, of uh, born shell script. That's how it works. This is the adjustments that I have made to this VM locally. So I'm starting BGPD. There's no flags. If it said no in uppercase, that would mean don't start it at all. Um, and incidentally, that does mean that there is no way in the OpenBSD RC system to actually pass the command line flag no to the command. <laughs> if you need to do that, you're SOL. Yep, BGPD is part of the OS. Uh, OpenBSD, one of its main strengths is as a networking OS, it kicks ass. It has BGP out of the box. It does OSPF out of the box. It does RIP out of the box. It does uh, MPLS out of the box. It does LDP out of the box. It does uh, pretty much every flavor of multicast routing going out of the box. Um, like your, your, your stock OpenBSD install even back at that package selection screen, if I'd said, no, don't install any of these optional packages, I still get a 100% fully functional router that can do more than most low-end Cisco devices. Out of the box. That's one of the reasons I like it. I'm so as long it. as you don't have to actually store anything locally, you're fine? As long as you're not storing large amounts of data locally, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Um, the OpenBSD project has made it very clear Performance is not one of their goals, not one of their primary goals. Like, yes, when things get too bad, somebody dives in, takes a look, and goes, well, let's clean this up. But correctness will always trump performance in OpenBSD. So if there's the right way to do something, and it happens to be slow on today's current generation Intel processors, oh well. <laughs> they will not make accommodations or exceptions for that kind of thing. Um, last one, package scripts. That's where all your add-on packages that you add in from what's called ports. So, you know, this would be stuff that you pull in from the yum repo. It's sort of kind of part of the OS, but it's not really part of the OS. It's something you pull in after the fact. This is where you start all those things. There's literally a script per well, it'd be a script per RPM in the CentOS world. It's a script per package in the OpenBSD world. Um, one thing I have done here that's a little unusual is I've turned off PF, which is OpenDSD's famous firewall, because I don't need it. I'm not doing anything on this box that I need firewall. The only open ports are ports that I want to be open. I don't really care about scrubbing TCP sequence numbers or scrubbing TCP flags or anything like that because I'm not shuttling packets from A to B, it's an endpoint. So really, it's like, why do I need it? I don't, so I turned it off. By default, PF is enabled with a allow all policy. For some reason, the sound mixing daemon is turned on by default. <laughs> I turn it off, since there's no sound hardware on a VM. There could be, though. There could be. OpenBSD comes with example config files. They're in ETC examples. Who'd have thunk? Unfortunately, they're also in user, local, share, doc, package name, examples, OpenBSD. So, you know, it's, it's not perfect. The world is not perfect. And what did I need? I needed a skeleton HTTP config and a skeleton BGP config. We're getting there. We're more than halfway done. I always add Vim because VI drives me up the wall. 
partly because my fingers are now used to typing VIM mm -hmm. so that I don't accidentally get VI <laughs> on systems where they both exist. And of course, I type VIM <clears throat> 30 times a minute when I'm trying to set up a new box. And if I don't have VIM on the system, this is driving me nuts. Anyway, here's what the package add. This is, you know, yum install or apt get install looks like. Package add, verbose, interactive. Z means be flexible on the package name. So, for example, I asked for Vim. Well, there's Vim this, Vim that, Vim the other thing. Like, which of these Vims do you want? That's what the Z flag gives me. You sound uh, like George Carlin, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, never mind. It's an old guy, Joe. Yeah, I know who George Carlin is. Thank you. Um, I wanted the one that doesn't have X11 support because there's no X here. I'm never really going to want to run Vim in an X display. It's just there for terminal use, and the version with X takes twice as long to initialize, load, and launch the file. So no, I'll just skip that whole problem right off the bat. And I don't plan on running any Lua, Perl, Python, Python 3, or Ruby scripts inside Vim. So, yeah, we'll just take the, blade, the bare bones version. Thank you. It automatically pulled in some dependencies for me. Done. Um, and again, this is fast. So if you've used DNF, say, any time in the last two years, you're aware that DNF is not exactly a quick package management tool, and apt-get is starting to go in that direction too. This, it's not blazing fast, because it takes a minute, because I gave it that Z flag, to go pull in the pull package database and look for close matches. But once that's done, yeah, it's fast. HTTP config. I did say, this is a web server, right? It's a web UI. And I don't want TLS. I don't care. There's no secure information. There's no highly confidential or critical information. So it's like, can't yeah, screw it. I will turn on TLS in a minute, but there's a catch-22. I'm going to use Let's Encrypt. I can't start the web server to get enough web server running to let the Let's Encrypt stuff validate my identity until I've disabled all the SSL stuff first. So I have to turn off SSL in order to get SSL in order to turn on SSL. This is common, this is normal. It seems a bit silly, but whatever. So my httpd.conf basically looks like this. Server line, listen, location, where in the ch, oh, and OpenBSD's web server, always ch rooted. No matter what, you can't turn it off. So if you want a non-CH-rooted web server, feel free to install Apache or Nginx or whatever other web server you want. The default web server is not going to give you enough rope to shoot yourself in the foot with, no matter what. So slash Acme, it really means var dub 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 Acme. Okay, as long as you know that, that's cool. And that is enough HTTP.com for me to run Acme Client, which, oh, is built into the base OS. AcmeClient.conf. Here's my AcmeClient.conf. Two authority stanzas, one for testing, one for prod, and then a stanza that says, here's what I want in my cert. That's it. So if you've used some of the other Let's Encrypt clients, this is, on the one hand, a refreshing breath of fresh air compared to, uh, say, uh, a <coughs> cert bot. Um, on the other hand, if you get anything wrong in the syntax of this file, mm. it gives you no help whatsoever figuring out what you mistyped. Just syntax error. It, it's almost like it's almost like add. <laughs> Question mark. There's exclamation mark. Whatever, yes. Question mark. Yeah. Yeah, this, 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 every time I do this from scratch, if I don't have a template to copy from, it takes me like six or seven tries before I've got everything lined up right and everything in the right spots. And as soon as you get it right, it just works. Until you get it right, you're like, what is going wrong? 
So my advice, copy etc examples acmeclient.conf to etc acmeclient.conf and then just edit the template. And then we run. We create the Let's Encrypt cert. So I have to start the web server. Um, so instead of system CTL start, there's now RC CTL. Start, stop, enable, disable, get, set for flags. Um, it's a major improvement over the old way where everything was just, you know, we'll find the binary and run it. Even I like this little bit of syntactic sugar. And then you run Acme Client dash DA. Acme Client, even the command line flags, similarly, if you get them wrong or you're doing things in the wrong order, good luck until you've tried every possible permutation and, oh, look, that one worked. If everything is set up correctly, you get an SSL cert that you can't use because the default is to get the cert from the testing Let's Encrypt authority so that you don't run out your quota of how many attempts you can make on the production authority before they blacklist you for the week. Um, so I've been there, done that. And it's like, oh, shit, now I have to pay for a cert because I need a cert this week. Crap. <laughs> um, and, you know, in ETC SSL, there's my full chain .pem, there's the cert, and private is a directory. Yep, private is the directory that holds my key it's in a separate directory so that it can have super restrictive permissions. This is much like etc PKI, I think, on uh, CentOS. Same idea. So now I go back, I edit it, I switch to the production server, I rerun that same command, and then I go back and I add the SSL cert back in, and I restart HTTP. So now my HTTP conf looks more like this. I've got, I actually had to, did I have to fix this? No, that's right. So there's two server directives. So if you're used to Apache, this is way cleaner and compacter and like everything's in the right damn place. You don't have to go searching through 27 config files and then try to guess which config files apply in which context. Uh, if you're used to Nginx, very similar to Nginx syntax. And really the only difference was this word, whoops, oh, it's not showing there. Um, hang on. Laser pointer? Okay, the word TLS right there, port 443 instead of 80, and this bit that says TLS, certificate and key. I had to change exactly four discrete things in this block to make it TLS enabled. Again, Compare and contrast to Apache. <laughs> and then restart HTTPD, boom, I'm done. I'm SSL enabled. And because it's Let's Encrypt, these certs expire quickly. Like every, was it 60 days? And you're supposed to renew them every 30? I think it's 90. 90? Yeah. Okay. 30 is the suggestion. It expires every 90 and you're supposed to renew them every 30. So OpenBSD's cron is much like Linux crons now. There's some syntactic sugar like at daily. And OpenBSD's cron just, or cron D rather, just figures out when to run it. It guarantees it'll run daily. Well, assuming the machine's on. Um, there's no anacron. Well, you can install anacron if you really want to, but there's no automatic catch up to missed cron jobs feature. That's usually not a feature, that's usually a bug. Um, and there's the entire line. Daily, run acting client, BGP mirror, da, 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 give it the host name. And if it succeeds, reload HTTP. Done. That's it. No like special cert bot magic question in the corner. I do not understand why every, every 90 days it's expired, then you run it every day. Yep, you're supposed. To, this is the recommendation: is you run the client every day. What happens is the client every day checks to see how far away from expiry is my certificate, and if it's within a certain threshold period, it goes, "Oh, okay, my certificate is old enough. I could start trying to renew it," on the assumption that you might not succeed. Something might be broken. 
and we want to give you 60 days to notice that something's broken, but more than every 30 days is a little bit ridiculous. Now, what if I've shut this machine off for 29 days? And the next monthly interval isn't for another three weeks. So running it daily and having the, code, the client be intelligent enough to say, so like how far out am I anyway, is a much safer approach than using cron to say, well, let's only run this once every 30 days. Um, that's the rationale. <laughs> It's not, I understand the rationale, it's not wrong. I don't think it really applies very often, but. It's like, kind of like, let the daemon do its own anachroning, plus it handle errors on the server side. Yeah. Basically, yeah, it's, this is the it's sort of belt and suspenders. So I'm gonna renew it early just in case, and I'm gonna try and check to see if it's time to renew it early much more often than the actual renewal so most days, like every you know, twenty every twenty twenty nine out of every thirty days, Acme client should check the date stamp, go, nope, not time yet, and exit instantly without doing anything. It's a reasonably lightweight thing to do. So I get it. It seems overkill sometimes, but I get it. And finally, BGP LG configuration. The BGP LG, BGP Looking Glass, the man page actually has the instructions for how to set it up. What a concept. Um, and if you're not familiar with OpenBSD, and this largely goes for NetBSD, and almost to the same extent, FreeBSD, everything has a man page. And I mean everything. There is nothing, there is no code in the base operating system that does not have a corresponding man page somewhere. This is, this is true of basically every single flavor of Unix except Linux. And even Mac OS, there is not perfect, but there's basically a man page for everything. A distressingly large number of Mac OS man pages say, this is an internal proprietary Apple utility. <laughs> Mm, that was helpful, thanks. <laughs> but at least you know it's supposed to be there and it's supposed to be running. Um, OpenBSD, everything you need. Now, the hard part is you got to figure out which man page you need to read to learn the thing you need to learn. That is not always immediately obvious, but it's there somewhere. And OpenBSD's man command includes features like full text searching context-sensitive searching, searching for function names, searching for file names, searching for you know, any arbitrary condition that you could like craft into, say, like a Lucene search engine, man can do it. It's, uh, well, it's insanely advanced compared to the Linux man command. Anyway, we chmod some files, we create some directories, and we copy some files. So I'm gonna switch here just for a second. Man.openbsd. Lose connection. Don't hit it too hard. It'll be GA. All right. Apparently, I'm not going to alt tab here. Can I? Oh, man, you could have zoomed in. I didn't like the alt tab for zoom. Man.openbsd.org. VGP LG. Search for everything. And zoom this in. BGPD is disabled by default. It requires four steps to enable the looking glass. Step one, step two, step three, step four. Like, oh, thanks. That was handy. I didn't have to open up a web browser to go visit, you know, Google and try and pick which of the 70,000 how-tos that are out there applies to this version. It's right there in the bloody man page. I don't think I could possibly overemphasize how much I like having everything I need in the man pages on the system I'm working on. Um, is that a little hobby horse of mine? Not like I'm having intensely held opinions or anything. I, I don't know what Kat's talking about. 
Um, so really, th those are the three steps that I have to do here. And still following the BGPLG man page, we add some lines to hpd.conf and we reload it. The lines we add are this, where it says fast CGI. And then down at the bottom, location, CGI bin, BGPLG, redirect it to fast CGI, root, well, it's not actually a real thing in the file system, so there is no file system root. Poof, done. We reload HTTP, it goes, that's nice, yeah, ready to go, what do you want? And uh, yes, <clears throat> I'll let that slide speak for itself. <laughs> yeah, it turns out you don't have fast CGI twice in the same stanza. They can be in parallel stanzas, but you don't put it in the parent stanza and the child stanza if you want things to work. Oops. So bgpd.conf now looks like, oh, sorry, now we're into bgpd.conf. I say route collector, yes. That turns on a few things, turns off a few other things. Basically tells OpenBGPT, you are not going to be making real decisions about routing. You're just there to amass a routing database. There's a socket um, so that you can actually run the BGP control utility and it has a way to talk to the daemon. Next hop, qualify via default. Now, BGP is smart. It knows that if I'm sending you a route that says, to get to that network, send your packet to this router. Well, if the receiving router goes, well, that's nice, but I don't have a route to that router. It goes, all right, well, that route is useless and drops it on the ground, ignores it. That's qualifying the next hop. So when I'm in a route collector mode and I'm never going to be directly connected to the next hop router, I have to say, nope, allow my default route to be used to qualify the next hop router IP address. So it's basically, relax your checks. You're not really doing, this is the matrix. <laughs> Nothing is real. And fib update no says, and by the way, don't actually update the kernel's routing table because there's no point. We're just a route collector. All we're doing is amassing the data. We're not making any real routing decisions, therefore, don't burden the kernel with this extra knowledge that it doesn't need or care about. I have to define who I am. I'm autonomous system number 16796. Everyone that runs BGP has an AS number. And all your routers, all my routers, run with AS 16796. U of W has an autonomous system number. They run with, I forget what it is actually. <laughs> Given how many times I stare at it in a day, I should remember by now, but I don't. Um, they've got their own. U of M has their own. MRNet has their own. MTS has their own. Shaw has their own. So every single router in Shaw runs under that same autonomous system. Autonomous just means we don't take routing directions from you. We decide our own routing policy. Thank you very much which makes sense, like MTS and Shaw. Well, MTS doesn't tell Shaw how to route. Shaw doesn't tell MTS how to route. They are autonomous. That's all it means. And everybody gets assigned a number. Kind of like an IP address, you go to Aaron and they assign you a number. Router ID, it's a feature of BGP, it tells other routers who I am, who this instance is. So if I'm looking at BGP debug output on another router wondering, why is this, why is my router crashing all the time? Oh, it's because of a malformed packet coming from router ID, blah, blah, blah. I can go back and figure out who that is. I set up a group, Hermes. Hermes is the name of my router. I, I didn't name it. I have no idea why it's called Hermes. It just is. Enforce local AS no, enforce neighbor AS no, export. So the two enforce things are again, relax the checks. I want you to take in all the data you can. Don't throw anything on the floor. Export none means, and uh, don't send anything back to Hermes because he's not listening and I don't want you polluting Hermes routing table anyway. 
You have nothing to contribute. Exactly. You have nothing useful to contribute to Hermes. Neighbor, well, that's actually the IP address of Hermes. Remote AS. Remote AS is, oh look, the same as my AS. And that's, that's a special thing. In BGP, when two routers with the same AS talk to each other, they, in turn, they go into a special mode called IBGP, interior BGP. This is a normal thing, and I give it a description, and then I do the same thing for the IPv6 address, because you have to talk IPv4 to get IPv4 routes, and you have to talk IPv6 to get IPv6 routes. There are extensions to BGP that let you carry either routing, either IP family in either IP routing family's packets. Open BGPT, BT, Open BGPD isn't quite there yet. So I have two sessions going, no biggie. The rest of BGPD.conf, group BGP research. Now that I have a looking glass, I can participate in a number of research efforts around the world who all want to get as comprehensive a view of routes from as far around the world as they possibly can. So <coughs> MBNOG is the Manitoba Network Operators Group. Um, for those of you who know Theo Baschak, it is basically Theo's pet project. Um, and he does quite a lot of BGP related research. I'm giving Theo a copy of my routing tables. There's nothing proprietary or confidential in it. It's all public info. It's just public info as seen from my little corner of the internet. Um, Theo's getting feeds from, I'd say probably dozens of people and cross correlates them and tries to see, to come up with interesting conclusions like everybody in Manitoba seems to have the same route to here even though they're all connected to different ISPs. Or every ISP in Manitoba has a completely different route to here even though it's all going to the same place. Um, and there, there's some interesting, there's some academically interesting things that can come out of that, and there's some practically interesting and useful things that can come out of that, like what should my next ISP, or who should my next ISP be? Um, and in case you're wondering, the single best connected, as measured by number of other networks that it connects to, the single best connected ISP in Manitoba is Hurricane Electric. It's not MTS, it's not Shaw. Second best is Shaw. MTS is about seventh or eighth. Um, yeah, and, and that's only because MTS has a number of clients that talk BGP to them. MTS only has one upstream ISP total. That upstream ISP, it may surprise you to learn, is Bell. Now, Bell is actually a perfectly decent ISP. They're connected to a fair number of other significant networks. So, yeah, uh, I think the third place went to less.net, who is, oh, coincidentally, connected to HE and Shaw. <laughs> Not MPS. Surprise, surprise. Would you add the same thing on the router? Yep. And on Hermes, I've got like a, a mirror configuration telling it, you need to establish a BGP session with the looking glass at this IP address, this IPv6 address, um, using these parameters. So yes, BGP configuration is bi-directional. Mm -hmm. You have to set it up on both ends at the same time. What do you do for those two that you don't have access? Like, so MBNOG and BGPmon Mon and Isolario, um, I'm in email contact with the people who run those servers and we exchange the uh, parameters that we need, we agree on a set of parameters, and then we both go program it into our routers on either end. Same as you do with an uh, internet provider. So uh, very similar, yeah. It's and then worth adding for folks who don't have an autonomous the system number is if you're experimenting with this, there are like Private ones you can use for private use, right? You're not going to interface yep. with anyone else. Yep. Folks, but uh, you can, as long as you both agree on a numbering scheme. So much like RFC 1918. So you can use 192, 168, whatever, or 172.16. whatever, or 10. whatever, and that's usually private to you. But you can connect to someone else 
and use private addressing as long as you both agree on what who's going to use which numbers. Same thing with BGP. I, I could connect to Theo using a private BGP number, uh, private AS number, I mean, sorry, as long as Theo and I are both in agreement on what number I'm going to use. I don't see why you'd be interested in it if you don't well, have any information I wouldn't. about public IP addresses. No, right? I, I wouldn't. I would use my public AS number. And because I've got public IP addresses, I would use my public IP addresses. But yeah, like if I was running this, say, from home or from some small business that didn't have public IPs or AS numbers, yeah, I could use private AS numbers to do some of the same things. Not everything, but yeah. some of the same things. Or at least, at least experiments. Yep. Or if you're doing EGP across a VPN link uh, to connect your hybrid cloud. Yep. Yeah, there, there's a lot of places where BGP is now used that are not traditional BGP routing. Uh, like you use BGP for any cast. You use BGP for um, hybrid cloud routing. You use BGP for MPLS, you, like interior to the MPLS protocol. You use BGP to distribute your labels. Um, so the protocol is now used in many places. And many of those places, yeah, you'll use private addressing and private numbering all over. Um, last thing in bgpd.conf is I need ACLs. Without ACLs, bgpd.conf basically does nothing. Because the default is, I, I think, deny all. So I'm saying, from Hermes, just allow, quick, stop evaluating rules, just, yeah, we're done. It's good, accept everything from Hermes, don't evaluate anything else. And then, on the opposite way, allow quick out to anything in the BGP research group. Quick means don't process anything else. Just stop the evaluation here, we're done. And that's my entire policy. Accept everything from my authoritative router and send everything to the research groups. BGP CTL show will now confirm that everything's up and running. That's what I get. And Hermes, you'll see I've received a whole whack of stuff, whereas the research ones, I've sent a whole whack of stuff. Oh, well, that's exactly what I expected. That's good news. Now, messages received and messages sent don't translate directly to, well, anything, really. It's kind of like trying to correlate packets received and packets sent with bytes received and bytes sent. Well, they're not a one-to-one. -one. There isn't a fixed relationship. I can compute averages, but that's why I need this final column, which is number of prefixes received. That's how many individual routes I've gotten from Hermes. Um, this number is old. That's the number of routes in the uh, Canary, which is Canada's national academic and research and education network. Much smaller than the entire internet as a whole, which is about three quarters of a million. If I ran this now, I would see three quarters of a million. But when I did this, I was still only running a small route table. BGPLG config. Last thing I do is customization files. And there's a CSS file, there's a footer file, there's a header file. That's the entirety of the config of the customization you get, unless you want to edit the source code, in which case, go nuts. And this is what it looks like. Show IP BGP summary, and it'll show, oh, look at that. Merlin is uh, participating in the Isolario, BGP Mon, and MBNOG research community school. Well, it's public information. So I will show you in a minute some of the other stuff. Further customization. I wanted to send anybody going to the website straight to the Looking Glass interface because it's at a path, CGI bin slash BGPLG. So I tacked on these last two stanzas. Anything in BGPLG, okay, that's like icons, GIFs, etc. Those are legit. I want it to come out of the HDDocs directory. Everything else, I don't know what you're trying to get to, but screw you, you're going to the looking glass. 
And that's it. That is the end of slideshow. So show IP BGP. So my IP address. My IP address right here, standing at this podium, is 142.1328.32. Come on. Oh, that's the control button, not my mouse clicker. I can do show IP BGP, da 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 da. I click submit. So if I was standing here at the U of W going, how the heck is Merlin sending packets to me? I could go here, plug in my IP address, hit submit, and this tells me a few things. It gives me a legend that says, oh, for destination 142.130.0.0 slash 16, which clearly includes my IP address. My gateway is that, which may or may not have any meaning to me. The really important part, though, is this AS path. It says, oh, I need to get there via AS22686. Well, AS22686 is U of W. So that tells me that Merlin is going to send that packet straight to me here at the U of W. No, there's no intermediate ISPs. There's nothing in between us, at least not at that layer. If I say, oh, let's say the famous quad eight. What is that? Google's, Google's DNS Google. server. Google's public DNS server. Public resolver. So my gateway is different, which you know, I happen to know. That means it's the MRNet gateway, but most people wouldn't. That's fine. It's the AS path that's interesting. And this tells me that from Merlin, to get to that server, I have to go through AS10965, and then from there, the packet has to go through AS6509, and from there, it has to go through it to AS15169. Well, 15169, I would go off and look this up separately, is Google. 6509 is Canary, the national network, and 10965 is MRNet, our local regional network. So, if I'm trying to figure out why someone at Merlin can't reach Google, I can look at this and go, okay, well, I know that that packet needs to go from Merlin's network to MRNet's network to Kennery's network to Google's network. And that gives me a sequence of things that I can now troubleshoot and diagnose and call the MRNet network administrator. Okay, they've established that, yeah, I see the packet. It went out to that router. It's out of my hands now. Oh shit, okay, well now I call the MRNet network administrator. And he goes, oh yeah, I see the packet. It comes in here, it goes out there, it's out of my hands now. Oh shit, now I call the Canary network administrator. Oh, I see the packet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right, that's broken. Hang on, let me fix that. <laughs> no. <laughs> so this is the, that's the kind of information that those three numbers give you. And this is all publicly available. You can, there are other looking glasses in the world. There's probably close to 100 of them, if not more. Um, actually, no, there's got to be more than that. There's a lot of them, anyway. Finding them is the hard part, but there are a lot of them. And you can amass, eventually, a fairly complete picture of who's connected to what. Um, actually, let me... Uh, <coughs> me. No. I think it's in here. Oh. No. I know where it is. GitHub.com. Five minutes. Hmm? Five minutes. Okay. No, that's not it. Seriously? <laughs> no, Henry Nog. MKDGP map. Did Microsoft eat your source code? <laughs> no. Um, with the research data that Theo is accumulating, in part, thanks to me, I mean, I'm just one of his sources, 
But with that data, I was able to do a bunch of analysis and come up with this diagram, which, uh, let me get that into a PDF. Uh, that diagram um, is the interconnection tree between all the ASs in Manitoba. The yellow box is the ASs that are officially listed as originating in Manitoba. There's one or two that I've excluded because they're obviously wrong. And there's another one or two that I've included because the official data says that, you know, the company's officially based out of whatever, Calgary, Vancouver, New York, but I know that the network is really here in Manitoba. So there's a little bit of manual tweaking, but this is mostly automated. Um, so the old box is everything that's inside Manitoba. That little blue circle up there is Merlin, because well, surprise, surprise, that's what I was interested in. All the red dots down here are Canadian networks, including <laughs> that one I happen to know is Canary. That's our national research network. And this green one is Hurricane Electric, and that's Shaw. The one immediately below the blue dot is less.net. So you can very rapidly, with all that BGP AS path information, figure out who's connected to who and draw diagrams like this. This is not the only reason I set up Looking Glass. I set up Looking Glass to be a good network citizen and you know, allow other providers to self-diagnose problems before they call me. Because really, I'd rather they fix their own problems first and then call me. Because otherwise, half the time you wind up troubleshooting someone else's problem while they're accusing you of it being your problem. And no, it's not really my problem. And, you know, so, um, but yeah, this was one of the, and this is, where was, where was it? Um, so MB, on GitHub, mbnog slash mkbgp map. <laughs> yeah, the source code's up there as well, in case you're curious. Anybody can run this and create the same diagram. Um, but yeah, this is one of the, one of the reasons I did this was so that I could do this diagram, and I wanted this diagram so that I could say, that should be the next ISP we connect to in order to get the best bang for our buck, connectivity-wise. There's other considerations, um, like the fact that 90% of the visitors to the websites and IP addresses I host live in Manitoba, which means they're either on MTS or Shaw for the most part. So if I'm already connected to MTS, chances are pretty good my next connection is going to be Shaw. But, you know, if there was a huge disparity, well, maybe my next connection should actually be Hurricane Electric. I don't know. Like, but that's what I wanted to see. So we've, I was able to see that. I was able to contribute to global research efforts into the, the global Internet's connected connectedness. I was able to get some interesting research results into Manitoban connectedness. And I've now got a tool online that, as I said, other people can use to assist with diagnosis of their network problems. Just like I use other people's looking glasses, they can now use mine for their own diagnostic purposes. That's all I have to say, thankfully, because it's almost 10 o'clock. Sorry, guys, that went a lot longer than I expected. Any questions? Any more questions? So where? Where's MTS? That was good. Oh, um, yeah. So, if I remember correctly, have I mentioned that zooming in Acrobat Reader is a pain in the butt? Uh, they're in here. Yeah, find them. Yeah. That's not a vector graphic, is it? Yeah. It is? Graph is. Right, but is it it's, it's a PDF. PDF. It's, it's not exported in the PDF no, no, as a one though. It's just the raster. PDF supports it. Yeah, it is. So lots of uh, 
Oh, oh, there we go. Two <laughs> bad and <laughs> one <laughs> connection. Now it's just not it's yep. badly alien. Yeah, yeah, where are they? Right there. Right there. MTS yeah. is uh, this one right here. Yeah. So these are all clients. The one going yeah, right. to Bill. Lots of children. Not many parents. And that one goes to Bell. Yep, and that one going down to Bell is right there. That's BA Calm, which is Bell something. Bell Alliance. Bell Alliance. Something like that, yeah. Yep, that's What's Shaw. What's that one there, Shaw? Yep, that's Shaw. Whoop. There's nothing in between there. Rogers, surprisingly, um, plays a fairly large part in connecting some Manitoba ASs to others. Zayo and all stream are still significant. Um, actually, I, really I think those would be higher up. Well, you'd think all stream uh, from the perspective of Manitoban ASs, hmm. right? Like all stream might have hundreds of other clients, hundreds of other ASs connected, but if they aren't in the path from one Manitoban AS to another Manitoban AS, they're not on this graph. Right. Um, Fiber Noir is in. Uh, Montreal or Quebec City, I forget which. The only reason they're on this map is because Voy Internet has them as an upstream for reasons. Zayo's moderately well connected, not awesome, but pretty good. They're a massive, massive backbone provider. Um, Cogent is well represented, but they don't really have a presence here, so I don't really care. They're in the path though, so it's on the graph. Um, yeah, even uh, Canary shows up there. Even Sasktel shows up moderately significantly. Um, so I, I was very surprised actually at some of the interrelationships on this graph. And now I need a bigger printer. <laughs> I printed this out across three 11 by 17 pages and very carefully taped them together. Yeah. And I can still barely read, yeah. like printed it at max DPI, everything, and I can still barely read the graph. So I, I need like a four foot wide plotter now. Well, you can use geography on the fifth floor. <laughs> no. <laughs> These are worth yours. Yeah. Um. No, if I need to print this out, I'll just go to Staples, it's fine. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's where MTS is. They're on here. They're, you know, they're, they're reasonably well connected, but considering they're the dominant telecom carrier in Manitoba, their connectivity is surprisingly bad. Mm -hmm. But, well, okay, it's not they're connected. So, yes, their degree of connectivity, not the bandwidth. They got lots of bandwidth, that's not the problem. But like to get anywhere from MTS, you have to go a long way away and then back. Um, that's the, that was one of the key. But they are basically just Bell. No, uh, from an IP network standpoint, MTS and Bell are still completely separate. Oh, really? MTS's upstream ISP is Bell. And that's their only upstream ISP. And which all the systems don't get merged overnight. <laughs> no, no, they don't. Actually, MTS, Allstream, Zayo, and Bell, um, together, that was like a, a multi-way transaction involving, I think, about six or seven separate autonomous systems and routers having to be reconfigured and changed ownership from this company to that company. And but they're all separate now. They're all they were. So it's well, it's like it's things that started out separate and then came together yeah, and then went off in their own separate ways, but in a different direction than they did originally. Right. And yeah, that's just the corporate thing. That's just the corporate thing. Yeah, the actual technical changeover at the routing level is, as somebody just said, not an overnight task. In fact, it's probably going to take about another two or three years to finish consolidating everything. 